All right, guys. <clears throat> this is IGCSE physics, um, summer 2014, paper 11. We've got quite a bit to get through, so we need to move through this quite quickly, and we're trying to get done in half an hour. A student, uh, okay, so this is basically asking you um, about which, which uh, cylinder to use. And I'm going to assume you guys have gone through this paper at least once on your own. <clears throat> And the answer is the smaller one, and you measure from the bottom of the meniscus. The reason why it is the smaller one is because it'll give you a more like accurate reading, and this is because the diameter <clears throat> of this of this measuring cylinder is going to be thinner and therefore more sensitive uh, to a volume change. You always, and then the, the reason why we always read from the bottom of the um, is because these are designed to be read from the bottom of the meniscus. I suppose you could technically find a way of calibrating one to read from the top of the meniscus, but that would be quite silly because with different liquids, you would have different height. The meniscus would have a different height, so you need a special calibrated one for all different ones, which we do not use. So it's always the bottom of the meniscus. Okay, this one they're trying to—they're just asking you <clears throat> um, which which one of these graphs represents a um, an, an object moving at a constant speed. So we've got, we've got distance and time. So we want something with a constant gradient, which is this one here. The gradient over here is the same as the gradient over here. This one is decelerating um, and going backwards. This one is moving forward but accelerating. And this one is going nowhere. It's sitting at the same place no matter what time we look at. All right. The graph shows the speed of a, a car, um, the change of the speed of a car over time. Okay, so what we want to do is they're asking us um, the distance traveled. So because this is a nice straight line, so it's not a curve like in this scenario, we can literally take the average of the speeds times by the um, <clears throat> uh, times by the time. Okay, and since it's 14, it goes from zero to 14. The average is literally zero times by blah blah blah. 14 times by this, and all of that divided by 2. In this case, it's quite simply that, number C. OK, which instrument should we use to compare the mass of an object? This is quite, it's quite straightforward. It, we use a balance, a barometer and a manometer for pressure. One is gauge and one is absolute. And a cylinder, as we know, is for measuring uh, volume. Liquid, uh, the liquid, um, If it, this is a question about comparing and calculating density. OK, so. You know, the, the liquid in question has 100 centimeters cubed um, in volume and a mass of this. So we take this divided by that and we compare it to this. Okay, it's going to be like 0 0.85 and this is 1. So the density of the liquid is lower than that of water. All right, this is uh, <clears throat> a, um, this is basically about like balance essentially. <clears throat> okay, it's asking you which is in um, equilibrium. Okay, and it's the answer is B because the reactionary force is acting through the center of gravity, which I've drawn in in the way engineers actually tend to scribble it in. In the other cases, the rea the reaction here, the little force to it sits on the surface, would actually try and like twist the object. So this one would just sort of fall over to the side because there's a torque, a twisting force that'll make that guy rotate. And similar for the others, that one would fall this way, that one would fall that way and so on and so forth. All right, a student adds weight to an elastic band um, and then measures the length, okay? They were just trying to ask you what this graph represents. The answer is D, measured length of the original length. This is because it starts from zero is one of the key points here. Um, and it's positive. <clears throat> All right, which energy transfer takes place when a matchstick is burnt? Okay, it was quite, quite a straightforward one, chemical to thermal. Um, it wouldn't be the others, it because um, it is an exothermic reaction. So the, it's getting, you know, it's, it's creating heat. It's going from the chemical to uh, thermal, not the other way around, which is the bottom option. And um, I've never heard of a chemical to nuclear. Um, I'm not sure about nuclear to chemical. All right, <clears throat> four cars are driven along a road. Uh, basically, this is just calculating power, which is work done over time. Okay. And so we just pick the ones. We start off with thinking, okay, these these guys, since the times are similar for both both uh, sets, you know, this group and that group. Um, in this case, this uh, we need to compare these two now because they got the most work done because that's at the top, and then we want the smallest amount of time, which is then this one over here. So the answer is C. All right, which situation? Um, 
uh, is an example of a force acting on a large area to use a small pressure, the keywords we want, small pressure. <clears throat> Hammering into a nail, that requires a lot of pressure. Cutting requires a lot of pressure. And nurse pushing a needle, a lot of pressure because it's uh, a small amount of force in most of these cases, maybe a little bit more in the hammer case, but it's all concentrated on a point where a soldier is quite heavy and the the boots of his uh the soles of his boots are, are quite um are quite have a fair amount of area so the answer is d all right this is um so the student places these beakers they all are the same identical beakers so they have the same area at the bottom here all right and since you know the pressure is um <clears throat> the force divided by the area so we basically want to find out if the areas are all the same. We want the one with the the highest the highest force because it's the highest because we're looking for the highest the greatest pressure. So we basically want to find the heaviest beaker. All right. So these have the highest volumes, but this one is salt water, which has got a slightly higher density, and therefore it is the answer. The student places his thumb on the outlet of a vice will stop the air coming out. All right. So. <clears throat> So what's happening? Well, we're, we're, we're like squeezing the air, we're decreasing the volume. And what happens when we decrease the volume of air? The pressure goes up, it works against us. Similar to a spring. Okay. Um, during evaporation, molecules escape rapidly from the surface of the liquid. So <clears throat> what's happening during evaporation? Basically, it's changing state. Um, from a liquid to a gas, this requires energy, okay? Where is this going to be getting its energy from? Well, locally. So it's going to be getting its energy from the remaining molecules, effectively. And uh, and therefore, if those molecules have, a, you know, if they're then decreasing uh, in energy, therefore, they're also decreasing in temperature, right? They're getting cooled down as we take draw the energy out. So the answer is A. A telephone engineer kicks, connects wires between two poles when the weather is cold. He makes the wires very loose, so it's sort of step back. You can see in the it's stars on the road, um, and it expects. So the answer is because when things get hot, they expand. And because it was loose before, expanding further would make it sag even further. So it's going to be, the answer is going to be D. All right. In an experiment, a thermometer is placed in a test tube of hot liquid. And the liquid is recorded every half minute. The table shows the result. <clears throat> what is the melting point of the substance? All right. The melting point is 55. OK. Because if we were to look at this in reverse, we can see that the temperature um, the, the temperature hits sort of like a plateau here, if you were to imagine heating it up instead. And we know that when, you know, you see like a plateau in the temperature, this means that it's changing state, right? So it's flat, so it's 55. Okay, which statement about the transfer of thermal energy is correct? Um, going through all of this, the radiation that transfers thermal energy is a type of electromagnetic radiation, that is correct. All metals do not conduct um, uh, energy equally, thermal energy equally well. Convection can only occur in solids or liquids. No, it can also occur in gases, and I don't think it can occur in solids, because um, convection is the movement. You need movement, and everything is locked in place in a solid. Convection occurs in a liquid uh, because hot liquid is more dense than cold liquid. Not true. It's the other way around, so we know it's that one. The diagram shows uh, this little setup here. All right. Um, and now they want to know uh, which is the sequence and how energy is, uh, well, which one of these ticks all the right boxes, okay? And it's D, because we have no convection and no conduction, and we have radiation. And the reason is because the heater is above, the hot air is going to rise. So it's not going to interact with the thermometer down here, okay? And since it's also moving upwards, there's going to be no, uh, you know, there's no, like, direct contact, so we're not going to have any, uh, conduction. Uh, however, this heat is also, you know, emitting radiation, so there, it is projecting radiation downwards. All right, and that is, and so we do have at least that. So the answer is D. Okay, scout signals is basically just to do with the incidence of like, like, light bouncing off of a mirror, and it 
usually sort of bounces off. Well, it always when when it's a mirror, it bounces off at the angle at which <clears throat> um, it came in at. So sort of these two angles on either side here would be equal. And looking from the diagram, this one sort of matches the picture well. This would bounce it back upwards to the sun. This would just let it skip back over. And this one would probably make it just hit sort of straight into the ground there. <clears throat> okay, a small boat and knob is protected from the waves on the sea by harbor walls. All right, it's not completely protected because the question asks is what is the effect of, you know, you get these waves then actually emanating coming out through the small gap. And this is called diffraction. Um, <clears throat> right, let's get moving. Okay, which list shows the waves in order of increasing frequency? We have visible light rays, then X rays, uh, then gamma rays, and this is the correct answer. Light rays have a lower frequency than gamma rays and X rays, so that's that's why that one is wrong. Um, X rays definitely uh, again same scenario. X rays do have less than gamma rays, but they have more than visible light, so that's why that one is wrong. And this one is the complete wrong direction. X rays have a higher frequency than than gamma rays and a higher frequency than light rays. That's why that one is wrong. All right. Which statement about a uh, covering lens is not correct? OK, we're just going to go straight to this one. All rays of light refracted by the lens passes through the principal focus. Well, if it's refracted, it means it's not being focused. It's being bounced off. Um, well, not straight off, but changed in direction, but not perfectly. So it, it won't go through. It's not correct. So it's being, it won't go through the principal focus. All right. Rays of light entering and enter and leave a box. I've just drawn in the, well, very badly drawn in the, what would the light would do. The box is going to have a um, different refractive index. Um, I'm just going to double check covering uh, what could be inside the box to make the rays behave its ray conversion lens, parallel sided glass block, plane mirror. Actually, I might be wrong. I think it is a uh, triangular prism. Let me just double check that. And that is number 22, number D. 22. Okay, no, so this could be. Um, yeah, no, I was right. Okay, all good. Um, basically, because the vision refractive index, light will come out. The other ones wouldn't work. <clears throat> Play mirror would just bounce it back. Triangular prism would uh, would actually probably diffract, would actually sort of split the light up. And a converging lens would focus it onto a point, <clears throat> which is not happening yet. It's coming in parallel. It's leaving parallel. Okay, a boy. A boy blows um, a whistle that is a frequency of 10,000 hertz. The boy's friend cannot hear the sound from the whistle. The friend has normal hearing. Okay, so if he's got normal hearing, so there, there, are two re there, there are two ways in which you might not hear the sound. It's either out of the sort of audible spectrum. In other words, the amplitude is, uh, sorry, the frequency is too high. Or the other way you might not hear it is if it's, the sound itself is just too soft for him to hear. So the or the, in that case, the amplitude is too small. Okay, so obviously uh, the amplitude is too large wouldn't be a thing. Um, the frequency, so the frequency is, well, it's not too low because that's all the way down in the hertz range. So these are the two possible options. But since 10,000 hertz is within uh, the uh, audible range, in other words, the frequency is then not too high, the amplitude must then be too small. In other words, you didn't let blow the whistle loud enough. <clears throat> Okay, so this is just about um, the nature of uh, sound waves. Um, which type of sound waves? Uh, what you know? What what type of sound waves? And what direction does the flame vibrate in? You've got a speaker here that's you know played against that. Uh, it's aiming at a flame. Um, we know that the type of sound wave is longitudinal, so the waves sort of the sound sort of compresses tightly and then expands and then compresses again and this sort of moves past. In that direction, so it's moving therefore side to side, and that's why the answer is C. All 
All right. Okay. This is basically just you have to just check where that you get like north and south coupling. All right. So we've got a north and south coupling there, north and south coupling there. I mean, this doesn't matter at the bottom. In this case, it's not right because we've got uh, south to south. Here we've got a south to south, and here we've got a south to south. So the answer is A. All right. <clears throat> I think actually, no, let's, let's erase this. No, no. Give me a moment. Okay. All right. Steel magnet is placed inside a coil. There is a large alternating current in the coil. The magnet is slowly moved out of the coil to position P. All right. All the way out there. It's quite far. Magnet is slowly moved out of the coil to position P. Steel magnet moved out of coil. Which is the drawing. All right. Okay. How has the steel changed, if at all, when it reaches position P? It becomes demagnetized, right? Because it's it's not influenced by the current anymore, and therefore it has become demagnetized. Let's just double check that answer. I figured that actually might be wrong. What's the number again? It is 26. Um, 26 is B. Nope. All right. It's become demagnetized. Okay. All right. So this is just about like uh, you know adding some charge to um, a plastic rod. Okay. What uh, what is the charge uh, um, charge on the cloth and which particles moved in the uh, charging process? So what happens when you rub a, a rod, a plastic um, when you rub a rod with like a, a cloth? Is that you're rubbing electrons? from the cloth onto the rod. Uh, so the movement, is, the electrons move. The uh, neutrons wouldn't move because <laughs> they're locked inside the nucleus. And the, the cloth is going to be positively charged because you're removing electrons. So that's why the answer is C. OK, this is just about um, uh, which wire would basically ultimately have the highest resistance. This is because you're measuring uh, current here. And the way to reduce the current is to increase the resistance. And then you, you're now trying to figure out which wire has got the most resistance. So uh, sorry, the le we're looking for the least resistance, sorry. Um, basically, the longer the wire is, the more resistance it has. The thinner the wire is, the more resistance it will have. So we basically want a short, thick wire. And that's why the answer is C. OK, the diagram shows a circuit containing a battery lamp. And as you're trying to figure out what this mystery component is here. And the light, you, when you close the switch, uh, when you like close the switch, the light goes on. And when you open the switch, the light stays on for a little bit. So there's something else that is keeping the electrons flowing. And since this loop is broken, it's something that's keeping the electrons flowing. But it's only for a brief period of time, which is the key word, and the fact that the light isn't on before the switch is closed. So this suggests that there's something storing energy temporarily, and that is a capacitor. <clears throat> None of these. So this does not store energy. This does not store energy. And this does not store energy either. So this is the only one that actually can hold a bit of energy and create a flow of electrons. All right. The diagram shows a circuit containing three lamps. Uh, uh, sorry, containing three lamps and three switches. They're saying lamp one and lamp three are lit, but lamp two is not. So if we, you know, let's draw a loop around the ones that are on. So if we go this way, it goes along there, it comes along there, that way, that way, and then that way. Okay. So therefore, this guy needs to be closed, and that guy needs to be closed. So S1 and S3. So basically, the answer is C. The diagram shows a part of an electrical circuit, right? And the light on the light dependent resistor LDR increases in brightness. What happens to the resistance of the LDR and what happens to the reading of the voltmeter? All right, so an LDR, when light hits it, decreases in resistance. So that's this one. So we have these two as potential options. As you can see, the answer is B. Let's talk through it more. Um, but in the case where this resistance is decreasing, because the potential drop across the same thing has to still remain the same. OK, the, uh, the uh, voltage drop across here must increase. 
because the voltage drop across here is decreasing. All right. Which label component in the circuit uh, shown uh, controls the brightness of the lamp? Okay. So the oh, the lamp X specifically. So again, just draw a little loop, right? Which components are interacting with it? <clears throat> we've got uh, we've got a variable resistor here. We've got the lamp in question, so the answer is B, that guy over there. All right, an appliance is connected to a mains uh, supply, to a main supply. All right, and now it's basically just asking what is the correct layout. Well, the answer is B. This switch, where the switch would short the uh, resistor in this case, so that's wrong. <clears throat> the fuse is now shorting the appliance, which is wrong. In this case, it's on the neutral line, so it wouldn't work. And hence, the answer is B. Okay. Um, so this is a. So the trick about this question was is they wanted the lines is from the perspective of the um, from the perspective that they've shown you. And as we know that when electrical current passes through, we get like, uh, if you imagine this is like a little cross section between there and there, we get a, um, you know, a magnetic field that wraps around the lines. And we would then therefore inside the coil, if you combine all of this up, you can imagine that all these straight lines then get formed in here. So this is the answer there. The answer is A. And this was... If you looked at it another perspective, you could maybe argue that this is not this is not wrong. All right, when a wire is moved um, upwards between the poles, um, we get um, uh, an EMF uh, induced. All right, they're asking which basically which technology uses this uh, to in this sort of mechanism to induce an EMF, and the answer is a generator. Basically, you have coils in a generator and um, a permanent magnet. Uh, and um, when the when you move the coils through the permanent magnet or the magnet um, you know around the coils, depending on which way around it's designed, um, you get a wire cutting across the flux lines between of the magnetic field that is created here, and you get an EMF produced that happens in a generator. <clears throat> All right, this is just trying telling you to like uh, using some information to work out what then the resultant uh, voltage would be. Basically, it's a step-up transformer, so it's going from 10 to 40, so that's 1 to 4, so it's timesing it by 4 effectively. So if you have 40 and you times it by 4, you get 160. All right, <clears throat> so cathode rays, negatively charged beam, passes between two metal plates. It's obviously going to be slightly attracted to what's well, going to be attracted to the, um, the positive side, and therefore it shoots off in direction B, right? Uh, the reason it doesn't wrap, on a, wrap in on itself in this really weird one is because basically there is no, there's no like positive charge back here. It wouldn't do a full U-turn. In which case, it would maybe hit, hit the, um, the plate there. All right, the table shows the results of an experiment to find the half-life, okay. So we just see that like the radioactivity dropping and we just find out like we like mark off when it's dropped um, you know half its life or half its radioactivity. So it's 150 here, it's 75 here, so it's gone, it's like halved itself, and it's halved itself, and this was at zero time, so it took 180 seconds. So the half-life is 180 seconds. Alright, this is just to do with containing um, uh, containing uh, radioactivity, and they're asking for the best material. Lead is best, it's always used as a shield because it's got the highest density um, and is used, like for example, in nuclear reactors as well as for shielding. Okay, this is just asking you about like these two little numbers. Okay, uh, so which one is the correct notation? I mean, lithium, so. I mean, they all have Li, so that's all fine. Um, the bottom number is the number of protons, and then the top number is always the number of protons plus the neutrons. So the answer is C. All right, cool. Thanks, guys. See you soon.